All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, uh, and I just want to sort of um, just start uh, to say that this is part of the uh, European Advertising Certificate. And this webinar is part of the EAC um, course and it will complement the learning path on effectiveness. Now, I believe that in the top left hand corner, you've got a chat box that you can pose some questions and answers. Um, which I will handle at the end um, and also just to let you know that the copy of this deck will be available afterwards um, so don't be too worried if uh, you haven't quite caught anything so let's sort of uh, start and let's get them so this is me uh, this is me many years ago when I used to have hair um, and basically my background is I've worked in advertising agencies all my life um, at Starch and the Grey, uh, where when I was there, I was the Global Strategic Planning Director on charge of GSK Healthcare. Um, in my period of time, I've won six uh, Euro FE awards for campaign effectiveness, and I have an MBA and various other bits and pieces. So um, I sort of know a bit about this area. So you know what? We're moving into a more metric world than we ever had before, particularly in the area of communications, where we seem to be able to measure everything. Um, so actually, it's no surprising that, therefore, if numbers are available, people want to go and use them. And we're seeing that even in football, American uh, games. There are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap. And then there's time. Welcome to Open. My job is to take this team to the championship. I need more money. We're not New York. We're not going to compete with a $120 million payroll. You've got to think different. Your goal shouldn't be to buy players. Your goal should be to buy wins. Who are you? Here, there's 25 players that have been overlooked by every other team for one reason or another, like an island of misfit toys. In here is a championship team, one that we could afford. Who's the kid? The kid is the new assistant GM. We're going to shake things up. Tell me. Do you want me to speak? We're not pointing you yet. It's the new direction of the Oakland A's. We are card counters at the blackjack table. We're going to turn the odds on the casino. You don't put a team together with a computer, Billy. Adapt to die. Billy Dean has come in and tried to reinvent a system. Now it's just not working out. They call it Moneyball. I think that he bought a ticket on the Titanic. Hey, Daddy, do you think you lose your job? What? Well, like go on the internet sometimes. Well, don't go on the internet. Watch TV. Talk to people. Do you believe in this thing or not? 100%. Listen up. You may not look like a winning team, but you are one. So, play like one tonight. We're doing something really unexpected and special, and the whole city is feeling it. If we win with this team, we change the game for good. This better work. I'm just kidding. And, you know, from all the evidence would suggest that it did work. And basically, it did change the face of most uh, major league sports, you know, because of the power of what numbers can do. Now, you know, there's many, you know, if you go to Kotler or anyone like that, they'll give you some very good definitions of what communications is. But at the end of the day, it's all about money. You know, no one's spending any money unless they're going to get money back. You know, so actually, we mustn't lose sight of the fundamental role that communications is, is to generate profit. You know, and I'm, there may be some other metrics that go before that, but at the end of the day, no one's going to put their hand in the pocket unless they get money back. And the trouble is that the advertising world, by and large, has come away from being at the top table. And the truth is, if we're just seeing as being grown-up people with colouring pencils in our, in our top pockets, then as such, we are going to be misperceived. And therefore, no wonder they're going to devalue the amount they're going to be prepared to pay for. So it's absolutely incumbent upon every single agency, be it a digital agency or be it the, you know, the old fashioned advertising agency, to demonstrate the added value they make to their car's business. And only then can you then have a justified place to be heard 
and a way to actually drive greater revenues for your for your agency you know and actually the reason is because it's changing at the client end as well you know we are seeing a massive shift over, over at the client end you know and this just sort of really depicts what we're seeing over there. Sorry. Yeah, what, what, what can I do for you, Rod? You just tell me what can I do for you. It's a very personal, very important thing. Hell, it's a family mark. Are you ready, Jim? I'm ready. Well, to make sure you're ready, brother. Here it is. Show me the money. And, and so what we're seeing here is, you know, no longer is marketing being sort of invited in just to talk about nice things that are insights and, and sort of image. You know, the chief financial officer and the CEO is really saying, show me the money. You know, I need to see a return because they're faced with actually trying to drive returns. And the end of the day, they're thinking, do I spend 10 million pounds putting a new um, uh, program together with the sales force? Do I spend 20 million uh, putting the factory in Shanghai? Do I spend the money on this advertising? So actually, if you can't demonstrate that you are giving a greater level of return on their money, you are at threat that the money is gonna go elsewhere. You know, and we're seeing a massive growth in empirical evidence in this space. And this is one of the most sort of well-known books out there right now, which is looking at the empirical evidence about how brands grow, which is making a shift much more into penetration strategies, much more talking about this thing called fame and saliency, you know, through mental availability uh, and an increasing drive towards distinctiveness as opposed to the old fashioned way we used to talk about differentiation. You know, and why is it so critical? It's so absolutely critical because, you know, in the old days, the value of an organization was based upon tangible assets. You know, the, the, the amount of stock which they had in their, sh in their back room, the amount of cash in the bank, their machines. And these days, intangible assets, which is mainly the brand, is actually the biggest factor which is driving the valuation of an organization. So therefore, brands sits at the very heart of company value creation and therefore it's critical that we start to recognize that in the way that we actually plan our campaigns so moving on about how you demonstrate that so that's all good stuff to start with how do you demonstrate it well you know here's the top line the very first thing is everything is down to your objectives so you've got to put time into clearly defining your objectives and be very clear, what is the specific role of your communications plan you're working on? And then actually work out in advance how you are gonna measure that before you get there. Then actually one of the things you've got to do, which is rarely done except in these effectiveness papers, is really prove it's not down to other factors. And then you've got to show an inextricable link from your activity through to sales because you did that, that happened, that happened, that happened, and then that happened. And what we know is that whenever you read any of these great case histories, either for the EACA or for CAN or for um, the IPA, they are wrapped in a compelling story, which brings the figures with them. And but the most important thing is you've got to start early on this. You can't leave it until two months before the, the submission date. You've really got to plan this from the very start. And you shouldn't be planning it just to write a case history. You should be planning it because that's your way of getting extra revenues next year. So let's go through one, each of those in turn. Prove your case against the agreed objectives. 
And clearly, we've got different levels of objectives. You've got your business objectives, which sit at the very top, the sales, the share, the profit, etc. You've got your marketing objectives, which are going to be something like to do with penetration, maybe some loyalty if you're still going down that line, yeah, pricing e uh, elasticity or what we call about inelasticity because you don't want it to be flexing um, when actually you put the price up. Distribution gains because many people are using marketing to help drive their gains to drive that physical availability. And then underneath that comes your comms objectives. You know, and obviously everyone's talking about fame these days, you know, but it's about awareness, it could be about education, it could be about image shift, it's some activity, e.g. a download, a call. So actually what we've got to be very clear is what are we trying to do? And only when you've got those can you then actually then be able to actually measure against it. And that's where those old-fashioned smart objectives come into place. Because actually only when you put numbers onto it, all too often I see cases where it says like sales increase, but by how much? You, we need to benchmark this. We need to benchmark it either by competition or benchmark it versus our past sales in the past years. And what we're then going to do is to make sure it ladders up. So actually it goes from the comms objective because we've changed awareness, is therefore led to that penetration gain, which therefore led to actually that share build. And that then helps to make sense of what we're doing. Because everything's got to be going back to that North Star about what they're trying to do. They're trying to drive sales or profit or whatever is the overarching commercial objectives of the organization. And then you've got to prove it's not down to other factors. Because the truth is, sales are going to happen anyway. People are suddenly not going to stop buying your product. And what we've got to do is we've got to talk about incremental sales, not just business as usual. And we've got to look at all the other factors, some of which are in control and some are out of our control. So has distribution changed? Maybe that kind of it. Has there been a big price drop? Has there been lots of promotions? What's the competition doing? Have they dropped their amount of activity or they increased their amount of activity? Maybe you bought a new product launch out. You know, maybe there's some big event, either you know when the Olympics comes or it completely changes the game, if you excuse the pun. You know, there could be PR activity, either negative or positive. You know, there could be an overall category rise. So if you are in doing, um, say, a cough medicine, well, actually, if there's an increase in flus or colds, then actually you're going to see your, your sales be going up. So nothing to do with your marketing activity. You know, there could be some seasonality stuff. There could be weather, political events, etc. So all these things come in. And you need to therefore start to track this to be say it wasn't due to that because that didn't change it wasn't due to that because we accounted for that bit and therefore we've got to show that link through to sales and we tend to use this model so like who did we reach how many people did we engage did they do something what was their outcome what was their behavior and what was the result that came about it and it just helps give us a layering upon what we're trying to go and do so a few techniques to help one of the key things we do is use comparisons and you do comparisons over a number of different things you comparisons region versus region this region had the activity that region didn't have the activity and be it a region in a country or versus country versus country it might be an advertised period versus non-advertised period before or after or a year on that stuff or it may be that you look at the sales of an advertised product versus a non-advertised product or maybe you're going to be doing like campaign one versus campaign two. So lots of different ways. And one of the things maybe, you know, the idea about having a dark region and a non-dark region. So, you know, as we can see in the example below, we've got where Sensodyne, one of the pros I worked on, you know, was running one campaign. It's sort of certain level lift. It then sort of much bigger lift be behind the dentist testimonial campaign. And for those who did no adver advertising activity, we saw a drop. And obviously, econometric model is the go-to standard, the gold standard, because it helps them do lots of different things. And obviously, the trouble is it takes about 36 data points. It takes a lot of money. But actually, it is very effective at doing lots of different things and helping to tease out the exact effect. And you can then use it to be helping you to sort of you know plan into the future. That said, you know, econometric model is not perfect by any ways and there are certain glitches within it 
And one of the biggest problems is social media is very difficult to measure because it's this low level hum that just sits there underneath everything else. And particularly if things move together, if you happen to be doing an increase in um, promotional activity around about the same time you're doing your advertising spread, then you can often find that those things work together and you can't really unpick them too well unless you deliberately set up a plan not to do that. And <clears throat> when we looked at it, we look at these sort of different building blocks. You know, we look at the inputs, you know, the soft intermediaries, the hard behavior, the proxy behavior, and the hard business. These are just a lot of different metrics you can use. And when I was looking at the IP Advertising Effectiveness Awards and the different metrics used, I, I counted about 35 different ways that people measure effectiveness. So you've really got to measure what's right for you and what is your campaign is about. So there isn't one set way of doing this. But let's go through this. Clearly, inputs helps let us know what did we put into start the process? Because without that, we can't then sort of check upon the cost of the inputs versus the outputs. So classically, it'd be TVRs or GRPs, and then we'll have other metrics outside of that, like the coverage level we got, you know, the number of people we reached, the frequency we reached them, the share of voice, which brings in the competitive element, the sheer amount of money we spend, you know, even to other things like the amount of PR coverage something generated. And then, of course, you've got impacts, impressions, delivery rates, etc. The soft intermediary metrics, these are things that are much closer linked to your advertising impacts because these are the immediate results of that so and these are therefore have a much closer tie in to what we're doing and clearly we need to have metrics at different stages along the path so we need the ones which are very close because very little gets in the way at this point whilst when you get to share and profit so many other factors are coming into play so some of the most in, in, immediate uh, you know metrics we're going to look are going to be awareness levels and that could be awareness level of the advertising awareness level of the brand it could be this top of mind awareness it could be prompted awareness so we've got to be very clear what exactly what we mean and we've got to make sure we're measuring at the right time because you can only really measure awareness on a pre and a post so you need to therefore have set up a pre-measure before you could do the post measure because how are you going to know whether you moved on or not Image is one of the big things we're trying to do because we have this belief that if we can change a person's perception about the attitude towards a brand, it's going to lead to a greater likelihood of purchase. So image, we're often looking to go and change. So we want to look at those. They tend to, by and large, move at a much slower rate. So they're not the best metric to be looking at. Um, but actually, they're still one of the important ones that many brands are wanting to try to move. And then we got the classic thing about consideration and purchase intent and net promoter scores. All of these are what I call sort of, you know, um, uh, not absolutes, because as we know, people are very nice and say they'll buy you when they don't, because in reality, they go in the store and they see something that 30 percent off. So they buy that instead. So it doesn't mean they wouldn't buy you, but it doesn't mean you actually leave to hard numbers. Then we look at some of the behavioural metrics. What actually? What are some behavioural things that people are actually going to do? So obviously, penetration. You're actually going to buy the stuff is important. Loyalty levels. They're buying you more frequently. The amount of sale, the rate of sale, is one of the classic things we're looking in FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. The weight of sale as well. You know, the sheer amount they buy at any one times. How frequently they buy the average price paid so are we selling 60 percent of our total sales on discount or are we now being able to move that into only 40 percent but then of course depending you may be working in a different category in which case lots of other things play a part like you know whether you've encouraged people to stop smoking or maybe your airbnb and what are your occupancy rates and those so these other factors come into play as well and then we have other metrics as well which again are sort of less hard nose but they're still like proxy and they're, they're they're intimating that things are going to happen later on so just because you search for something it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to buy it but it's still an action you've gone and done so is open rates view rates click through rates dwell rates click through um pass on rates sign up rates download rates footfall inquiry rates test drives 
social commentary said are all measures that you can look at as well you know to see what you're doing but we've got to be, be careful we don't get too lost um in the woods when we're doing all this stuff and these are the hard ones these ones which at the end of the day you know we've got to try to get back to and i appreciate this is quite difficult because sometimes you're not given these numbers and sometimes so many other factors have come in the way which therefore completely nullify any effect that you did you know the profit is the ultimate one how much money are they actually banking you know you know one of the big case studies uh, which were done for the snickers campaign for the ipa gold they talked a lot about how there's massive cost savings because they're only making one global ad rather than having to make lots of different ads you know sales is one of the most likely ones and we've got to be making a difference between consumption which is you know sales the actual consumer makes versus x factory sales which is a very un, un, unrealistic figures because you could be just merely stocking up the the warehouses out with your customers with stuff but it's not coming off the shelf share is one of the big ones we always talk about and obviously you can go to even the higher things about what's the company share price doing how's that changed and obviously we talk a lot about Romy return on marketing um, income um, investment. Now, when you're deciding on the metrics, again, to re-emphasize this, you've got to decide them upon the key objectives of what you're trying to do and to follow the path of conversion. And that's what we do. That's why that lovely Einstein quote about not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So just because you can get this classically quoted Facebook like, it doesn't necessarily mean anything unless someone has actually been able to demonstrate that basically for your particular brand, a Facebook like does lead to persuasion, does lead to them picking up, you know, um, their credit card and going to buy your product. You know, and so we have all these hundreds of different metrics, and this is just a fraction of what you can measure these days, particularly online. And you've really got to say, which are the ones that we are looking at? And frankly, the answer lies in only 5% of the data rather than the 95%. And we've got to be very careful we don't get confused and lost about quoting about this things. Too many presentations, I see them, this long tail of stuff, and we've lost sight about what's really important. The best thing you should do is you can save a fortune by stop measuring stuff that doesn't matter you know because all too often you're buying this on top of nielsen and that on top of nielsen and that on top and before you know you're wasting a lot of money so let's talk about this return on marketing investment one of the most important things you've got to do and i encourage you all the time to do it as much as you can on as many of your campaigns as possible you know i know one advertising agency which basically had done some 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 you know they can't be great sums but there must be good sums to demonstrate that their advertising is usually twice as effective as any other competitor within their field well that's a compelling argument to go to new clients over so what do we mean by return on marketing investment in a finite world where investment strategy gives the greatest return what do i give if i give you 100 euros do you give me back more money by doing this project than if i go give it to another part of the organization and you've got to do that. And basically, Romy is a measure of efficiency versus profit, which is a measure of effectiveness. And Romy is net incremental profit. Note the net. And is note the incremental profit versus cost of campaign. So what do we mean by that? It means incremental. It means we would have had sales anyway. So what's the extra sales is generated? And net profit, we've got to take out all the extra costs involved. All of the um all the costs of actually producing that extra stuff we've done so we've got to do that and you times it by 100. so you've got to include all those marginal costs you know the variable costs included in the campaign but excludes fixed over so you're not going to add more for the factory because the factory's already there but the fact is you've still got to make that new tube of toothpaste you've still got to fill it you still got to pack it you still got to deliver it so those are costs over and above things so you should be taking those into account and what I often find is because more and more we're going after penetration strategies, it's quite realistic to start to take account of what's the total lifetime customer uh, value of a new game. Because they could be staying with you for five years, buying your toothpaste, for example, three times a year. Well, therefore, you gain that by the marketing activity now. And if you can somehow work that out, it seems to me that that is a fair thing. And a lot of work 
done by other econometricians talk a lot about the long-term value that marketing and particularly advertising communications plays in driving stuff. And we shouldn't stop measuring stuff just after the first year. So here's an example. I won't go through it. I'll leave you to download it, look at it later on because you can sort of see how it all works. But this gives you some very basic sums so you work out what, what you've got to go and do. And lastly, I'm going to is some recently quoted profit return on marketing investment figures, which are being published through the IPA Advertising Effectiveness Awards. So you can see you got like up to where one pound invested in the John Lewis campaign in 2016 generated eight pounds 79 in profit. So it not only paid the one pound back, but it also gave eight pounds 79 pence worth of profit down to some four pound figures some four some three pound figures some two pound six and one ninety the truth is if you earn more than probably at this date three percent so even if it goes down to 103 that's still more than you get if you put it into the bank now frankly i'm sure there are other projects and organizations could do which is even better than that but that's really what you're going to want to go and do so in summary you know, what I've said is like, Romy is king. You've got to make sure that you are demonstrating your return on marketing investment. That said, I would say that ultimately, you've got to be very careful with Romy because the Romy is basically a calculation that can be basically gained. Because if you want to increase your Romy, all you need to do is reduce your investment. Because actually, if eventually you get down to the point where it, if you get a 1% increase in sales because of something else and you had no investment whatsoever or a penny investment, you would have the most amazingly big piece of Romy out. So you've got to be a bit careful about that. The other thing I would say about it is I believe we should do look at it on a holistic basis because some parts of your, 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 your total integrated advertising campaign will deliver greater um romy than other so search is always going to give you much higher romy but then your social will ever do but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do social you should put all your money in into it into um search because actually at the end of the day what you're ultimately doing is you are able to bank profit but you can't bank a romy so you do want to drive up penetration and coverage and you only do that with some of these big expensive media choices which basically are more costly in terms of your romi you've got to prove your case against your objectives objectives is everything until we know exactly what you want to go and do and you can't change your objectives halfway through and why we need to metric this is because frankly if your campaign is not delivering against your set objectives you've got to change your campaign you've got to change your strategy to make sure you're hitting what you want to hit and then you've got to prove it's not down to other factors and i always like to show an inextricable link that because i did that that bit of awareness led to that change in image that change in image led to actually um people going into doing more test drives shall we say and because of doing test drives we saw an in incremental number of cars being sold etc and my last point is gather your data early because if you don't you will be stuffed about this stuff and you need to spend money upon getting that data in so really that's all folks so now i'm now going to look at any questions uh, that you pose just to see if there's anything here all oh, right okay so i've got some over here um i'd like to know my opinion on engaging market research companies for measuring effectiveness and when in the process an agency should contact research to measure a campaign um there are many many very good research companies who will be very happy to sell you a lot of research and I think what you've got to be is before you start opening up the conversation, it's like going to a sweet shop before, you know, you're buying too much stuff and you don't need to buy this stuff. It's be very clear exactly what it is you want to measure. And then you go and find a company who can measure that effectively for you at a cost effective way. So um, that is, I think, is sort of one of the most important things, you know um so yeah you should be using them there are there's frankly particularly if you're doing digital there's you know there's a lot of stuff for free so you don't necessarily need to go and 
spend a lot of money but at the end of the day you do need to invest something particularly if you're doing tracking you know that is going to cost you some sort of money to be putting that out in advance and obviously you're going to be tracking your sales so you're going to be using someone like a sort of nielsen so that so you do have some big ticket things you need to spend money on but actually at the end of the day it saves money because you demonstrated the effectiveness of it this is one person said, as an account exec in a creative agency, how can I become more involved in measuring effectiveness in campaigns? You know, I think one of the things for that is what you should be doing is you should be making sure that at the end of the creative brief, there is a box which says, how will we know we've got there? What does good look like? And we start asking questions like that. So that would help you to achieve that. Another person asked, so essentially, the agency will benefit from positive results from pre and post testing. So should they invest in this or is it the norm that the client will foot the bill? Um, I think it's in the interest of the client to foot the bill for that. I've never known in my time for an agency to pay for that. Um, so, no, I don't think we should be paying for that. Um, there are there's little enough cash floating around inside an agency to pay for that and that's up to them they, it's their money and they wanted to, to demonstrate the effectiveness of that stuff um you know it's it's often up to the agency to prove it but we expect the client to pay for that right i have another question here can you share with us an effectiveness mathematical model for about how tv leads to sales in fmcg category or in others i'll read that again can you share with us an effective mathematical model formula for how tv leads to sales well you know the like I, I, the best way still goes back to econometric modeling because what we do with econometric modeling it's a multivariate analysis now what you do you you plug in 36 months worth of data points of your sales and it then plots about what your uh, what the amount of money you spent behind it your 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 distribution and all those factors get taken into account and it works out what is the perfect relationship when you just go as we see all the time a straight correlation between where on one hand we'll have grps and we'll have sales and we say there oh, look at it, it's fantastic do you notice how every time we've advertised, we get a shift in sales? Ipso facto, advertising works. Well, you know, as we know, anyone in statistics will tell you that co that correlation does not necessarily mean a causation. You've got all those crazy things we talked about in the past about where the skirt length has gone up and down in line with the with with the stock market, which is absolutely nothing to go and do with it. But actually, that's what people do. People start with a very basic sort of, you know, correlation. And obviously, it looks very nice and suggests that there is a clear uh, causation result, which could be the case. I'm not saying it isn't, but it doesn't necessarily prove it. When you go to econometric modeling, you get much closer to, to that. Um, I've asked questions. So nowadays, is it incorrect to focus on the added experience that the brand can offer to the consumer? Do you have to just show the Romy? Well, again, I think the question comes back to what were you trying to do? If your objective was to drive a you know customer experience and to um, uh, make them be more socially engaging and to do you know posting stuff about you then they become valid measures as well because it, all we were trying to do is say did we achieve what we set out to go and do and if you want to just set out to put a smile on people's faces then actually therefore you've got to prove that you put a smile on people's faces so it doesn't necessarily have to be a return on marketing investment frankly though if I was any commercially focused advertising agency or any commercially focused client, I want to be able to at least see that my 100 million I've gone and spent on this has demonstrated some return. Because if I haven't, frankly, I'm going to be out of a job in 18 months time because no one is going to want to keep me on because at the end of the day, it's all about the money. You know? 
Um, is there best practice for getting client agencies together after campaign to analyze effectiveness and use learning for future campaigns? I think that is always good to have a wash up meeting. The trouble is things are moving so fast these days, you're onto your next campaign, your next sort of um, activity before you need to even wash up on the last one. I, I think it's always worthwhile doing it. Um, I think what happens is you need to look at it on two levels. You've got to look at how was the process, how could we do things better next time, just between the relationship between agency and client and the amount of information we got and how we improved it. But then there is a case of how do we measure this stuff? And you can't do that after the meeting. You've got to do it at the very start because you need to have decided what the metrics you're going to measure this by. And honestly, one of the best things to do is when you are agreeing your, your income and your profit and your bonuses, those are linked into some of these tangible metrics that you've got about campaign delivery. So therefore, it's incumbent upon the agency to be doing that. Um, so I suggest you do make sure that, that that's done. And at the end of the day, it's what gets asked for. If the client says, I want to see a Romy or I want to see a paper, they will get done. If he doesn't ask for it or she doesn't ask for it, it won't get done because the other things take over. Are three measurement points enough? What time, season, moments would you recommend? Well, look, we're probably talking there about the classic sort of tracking study about pre, post. Um, and it's one of those things, you know, you definitely need to do a pre and you need to do a pre within probably about a month of your campaign starting because before then other things can get in the way. So you need to do it sort of you know, within a month before the campaign starts. As long as a campaign has got a decent amount of weight for it, you want to do a, a middle tracking point in the middle. And then you want to do one which happens quite shortly afterwards. And ideally, you want to do one, should we say, three, four, six months after that as well. So ideally, you want to push for four. And frankly, you know, um, you can get away with three. And certainly, I've seen people get away with three. And actually, if I had to do three, I would probably drop the in between the one that happens in the middle of the campaign, because frankly, there's you won't get the data back probably until afterwards. So it's not going to tell you that much. But I want to definitely have a pre and we need to have a post. And I think the most the benefit, particularly with campaigns, is to have a later one, particularly if you're using TV, because TV does take a longer time frame on that one. Um, just double checking and answer all the questions. Another one's popped up. A person said many thanks. Um, so if there is it, like I say, we'll get hold of the deck for you um, and allow you to now go on your merry way. Um, enjoy the rest of the day, and I hope you found this of use. So thank you very much. I'll now officially sign off.